It's our privilege, sir. We are very honored to have you all today. And uh, after we start, I actually want to talk about it because, you know, our mandate was also to encourage uh, deep thinking in the natural sciences, but we haven't done much on that front. And uh, with people like, uh, you know, distinguished lecturers like you joining us, we want to take baby steps in that direction. So this is a very auspicious start for us. Yeah, no, that's indeed too, true. And we, I was just pointing out uh, that your, your observations and inputs for STIP were very compelling. Uh, indeed, coming from a different perspective. Uh, so, you know, we are totally grateful for that and they have been factored in the policy. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, it's, it's about three o'clock and uh, if we want to stick to the time, we can. And uh, the thing is that most of our fellows have not yet come back from the winter recess. So we have only a few uh, who are on the campus. Some may join uh, from uh, wherever they are right now. And the rest are, of course, uh, going to see us live on YouTube and Facebook just now. So even if we have a, a small cohort, uh, you know, of maybe 10, 12 on Cisco WebEx itself, uh, we might actually uh, start if if uh, if all of you think so. Absolutely, and you know it's, these uh, occasions are very valuable to hone one's uh, perspective and argument. And uh, the number of people is not so important as the very high quality which you have. So I think we should uh, uh, get started. Thank you. That's that's very kind of you. I will I was saying that uh, I was once at Oxford, I was spending the Michaelmas term as the, uh, you know, Shivdasani fellow in Hindu studies. And uh, I went to a lecture by a very distinguished speaker in philosophy. In fact, he was one of our own uh, Radha Krishnan memorial speakers. His name is Professor Richard Sorabji. And uh, he's one of the top uh, uh, scholars on stoicism in the world. So we went to the Department of Philosophy of which he was the head, and only there were there were only two people other than myself. So there were the three of us, and there was Professor Sorabji going in full flow, you know, for you know almost an hour, and then there was a very lively discussion. In those days, we didn't do simultaneous broadcasts on WebEx or whatever, Facebook. So then at the end, I said, Professor Sorabji, isn't it uh, a little? Uh, uh, you know, disappointing that for such a wonderful lecture, you had only three. He said, you know, Makran, even if one showed up, I would give my lecture. Because in Oxford, he said, every day something or the other happens. So we, we address the imaginary and invisible audience. We don't care about the physical presence because, you know, all the fellows and all the people of my college and my previous, uh, you know, people, they're all attending. They're all here and listening to me. So I said, that's a very Hindu idea. And I, I really resonate to that. Uh, and of course, he has an India connection. You know, he's the nephew of Cornelia Sorabji, uh, who was a great, uh, you know, lady during the freedom struggle. She was a Parsi lady from Bombay who then worked on the Zanana mission and so forth. Yes, but yes. we'll start yes, in a minute. Yes. Uh, just one second. There's somebody, I'll just shut my door. Just one George. second, sir. For a, for a philosophy lecture, three are too many. I, I'm sure he would have been uh, totally okay lecturing to himself. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, so yeah. wonderful. In fact, there's another one, uh, Chand S. Chandrasekhar at University of Chicago. He used to drive uh, eight o'clock in the morning in Chicago snow from a suburb to teach two students. Uh, and both of them get Nobel Prize before him. Wow. wow. That is a story to, to cherish and remember, you know. So on that wonderful note, uh, if you permit, uh, Professor Vijay Raghavanji, may I start? Shall we start? Yes, please. Thank you. Thank you. So, Namaskar and welcome to all. 
Today is an auspicious day for us because we begin our new academic calendar, especially our distinguished lecture series for this academic year because we have just opening up after our winter break. We have a longer winter break here. So technically we open on the 1st of March, but uh, I think today is a very auspicious day for us. And uh, uh, Professor Vijay Raghavanji, Krishna Swami Vijay Raghavanji is our first speaker in our distinguished lecture series for this academic year. I welcome you, sir. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm very, very honored and grateful to you. I'll speak a little bit uh, about you, but uh, I think the honors will be done today by our other very, very distinguished uh, participant, uh, Professor Ashutosh Sharmaji, who is the Secretary of the Department of Science and Technology. He will officially introduce you. And I also want to welcome uh, Dr. Gupta, who is a very eminent uh, scientist, as well as a leader in this area. All three of you are, are very, very welcome. I must say that uh, I must uh, also announce that we are starting a very exciting season of distinguished lectures. Uh, next week, uh, uh, we propose to have a, a wonderful event in which uh, we are going to talk about bringing our gods back home. In fact, we might say they never left, but our speaker is somebody who specializes in retrieving uh, stolen antiques and sacred, uh, should I say, objects including icons and statues and images uh, and bringing them back to India, uh, often to the temples from which they were taken. His name is Anurag Sharma. He'll be joining us from Singapore. And uh, after that, on the 8th of March, we want to observe the International Women's Day with a very distinguished speaker, Jaya Jaitli Ji. She'll talk about craftspeople in India, especially women, and uh, their contribution to our culture and also the challenges they face. And uh, then on the 16th, uh, uh, we propose to have a lecture by uh, Dr. Balram Bhargavji. Uh, of course, the vaccine rollout is at the top of the government's priorities, and we've just heard that private players will also be encouraged to help in this great mission. And I think we can't think of anybody better than Balramji, uh, Dr. Balram Bhargav, who is the chair of the ICMR, Indian Council of Medical Research, uh, to help us and take us through this. I must say once again that I'm deeply honored to have such distinguished speakers in our uh, list uh, and that we have just started recently to bring in people from science and technology. We had one lecture earlier uh, by uh, Dr. Shekhar Mande, uh, the Director General of CSIR. So, and, uh, uh, we, and we have at present only one kind of bona fide person from the sciences uh, that is Professor C.K. Raju, who's working on Ganit versus math. But we hope to enlarge this cohort and get more people because I think that uh, the idea that uh, some of uh, our science leaders today are promoting that of open science is something we resonate with. We want to connect science with society and uh, science with non-science, not science with nonsense. So some of us are not in science, but we are deeply interested in science. We're interested in the history of science and the philosophy of science. We're interested in how science is conducted in particular cultures. And we're in, interested in ancient knowledge systems, Indian knowledge systems. So, uh, you know, I think that uh, these interests dovetail very well with, with what our own uh, prime minister and others who are at the helm of scientific matters in our country today are trying to accomplish. And when it comes to innovation, when it comes to technology, science, technology, and innovation, we know that innovation happens in all areas of life. But I think science and technology have a key role to play in bringing these innovations to fruition. And I was just reminded uh, by way of an introductory remark of, you know, what our uh, one of our top, uh, I should call him uh, market uh, uh, experts or investors, our own uh, uh, what should I say, Warren Buffett of India, who, uh, you know, Mr. Junjunwala said, he was talking about the enormous success of the Tata Group. Uh, uh, and he said that is because Mr. Chandrasekhar is a technologist. He headed TCS and he made the point that the Tata Group is doing very well because they've vetted the latest technology and processes uh, into all their companies. 
and the companies are going through a very robust transformation today. So that's a good example of how science and technology can improve, augment, magnify, add value to almost all areas of our life and our endeavor. Uh, having said that, I don't want to take up more time and, and uh, actually, uh, you know, uh, do what uh, Professor Sharma has set out to do, but I just want to say one or two things. Uh, the thing that I wanted to say is that the position of uh, uh, that that uh, Professor Vijay Raghavanji occupies is is of paramount importance in India. If I'm not mistaken, it was actually started. The principal scientific advisor uh, to the government of India was the position started by the Vajpayee government, and the first uh, incumbent was none other than uh, you know. Mr. APJ Abdul Kalam, you know, uh, one of our most famous and visible, uh, should I say, technologists, technocrats, uh, and of course, our beloved president of India. And after that, it was a position that was occupied, if I'm not mistaken, by Dr. Uh, you know, Chidambaram, Raj Gopal Chidambaram, not to be mistaken with Mr. P. Chidambaram at all. Uh, and uh, I think uh, Dr. Chidambaram had a great role to play in our nuclear program, especially in Pokhran 1 and 2. So this is a very important position. It enjoys cabinet rank, and we are very honored. So I know how busy you are. I had the good fortune of meeting you at the inauguration of Aramb at the Statue of Unity, and you gave a very wonderful presentation to the, uh, you know, to the probationers, to our officer cadets, at the Statue of Unity, the Prime Minister was also there. And uh, since then, I've followed your work with, with great interest. You're a Fellow of the Royal Society. You're a Foreign Associate of the US National Academy of Sciences. You're a Padma Shri, you won the Infosys Prize. And uh, you're a Bhatnagar Award winner. And I don't know what else, must be many, many more. But uh, briefly, what, what is in common uh, that you have with, uh, with Professor Sharma is that both of you are chemical engineers at IIT. He went into nanotechnology, and I believe you've gone into neurogenetics. And uh, I, I went to your, uh, I went to your website, sir, uh, you know, of your, of your institute of, of, uh, of, uh, you know, associated with the TIFR, where you did your PhD, you still continue, you have a lab there. And uh, I, I was just, I want to share with our fellows, a couple of lines from from your current research, uh, and uh, and uh, and uh, I think I think that uh, I think it's a, it's 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 very fascinating to me. Uh, you know the kind of work that you're doing uh, right now in your lab, because I think it has to it has to do uh, with 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 an extremely important area, you know, of of research. This is the NCBS, of course, the National Center for Biological Sciences. And if you permit, I just want to read one little line. Uh, and I, it struck me because we just recorded a Pongal dialogue uh, for a conscious planet with Sadhguru. And uh, we are going to broadcast its second, uh, uh, you know, installment tomorrow. And all of you are invited. And, you know, he challenged me. He said, Makrand, uh, you are talking about death. We were talking about Corona and untimely death. He said, have you understood life? And so it, you know, put me, uh, I said, well, I, I feel, I know I'm a living being. And uh, I, I think I have some sense of what life is. He said, tell me, your parents contributed one cell each. How did you become what you have become, you know? And again, I was quiet. And he said, did you see that champa tree there? Throw some filth on it and see how the flowers bloom tomorrow or in a week. He says, what is it that makes it happen? And I was studying your group and you said, I'm quoting, our group focuses on the integrated sequential development of sensory and locomotory organs of the fruit fly, in particular muscles, nerves, neural circuits, and the behaviors that they enable. At the top of the command chain, we explore how the Hox genes themselves oversee muscle, nerve, and behavioral specialization. So, of course, you're studying the fruit fly, but the thing that interested me is that what is it? What is the hard wiring? What is the genetic programming in our own, uh, you know, systems which which produce, you know, our physical, uh, uh, you know, our, you know, what is the connection between our 
you know, our, our genetic codes and what we become. You know, of course, between genotypes and phenotypes. But uh, even if you're not interested in that particular phenotype thing in your own lab work, I still think that trying to unlock, uh, uh, you know, the secrets of that transformation is, is really very fascinating. And I think that uh, if we are uh, at the cusp of trying to uh, actually, uh, you know, go forward in science communication in India, so that a lot of people, you know, when I was growing up, we had science today. Today, we have nothing like that in India. We have to make science accessible. We have to communicate to a wide range of people, non-specialists, uh, and uh, make them interested in science and bring up a new generation of very curious young men and women. You know, that will safeguard the future of Indian science. And I think all of you are playing such a wonderful role in that. And I'm now going to turn, uh, turn it over to... Uh, Professor Sharma, but with your permission, you know, I discovered that he's an artist. You know, when I when I was observing him in our last uh, STIP meeting, and I found uh, Professor Sharma to be a very relaxed individual. You know, he laughs easily. And uh, and then I thought to myself, there must be some secret. And then I said, uh -huh. it's a left brain, right brain harmony. He's a totally relaxed individual. Um, I'm not going to go into his bio data in great detail, but he, he started as a chemical engineer, again, IIT trained, and now he's into nanotechnology, among many things. He's been DST Secretary, Government of India, for over five years. His PhD was from uh, SUNY Buffalo. So I was given admission there, but then I went to Illinois, Champaign-Urbana instead. But the thing that I, wa I wanted to say is I discover he's an artist, okay? And, uh, you know, he's a very generous artist. If you go to his website and if you like any of his paintings and if you write to him, he will give you a high resolution image which you can download and frame without any charges. As far as I know, I may be mistaken. He may charge, but I don't think so. The website says if you like any of my paintings, you write to me. And he also does poetry. OK, and he's done more than 500 of these things. And uh, and then he says, and I'll end here, he says, copying the above strategy. What is the above strategy? He says, whenever he goes to meetings, why is he relaxed? Because he's doodling and creating art. <laughs> and nobody knows that. And then he says, don't copy me. He says, copying the above strategy in the presence of your boss may be highly injurious. For any boss is a boss, only because <laughs> she's a boss. And then he says, I have no boss and no reputation to maintain. So that is the secret. <laughs> that is why he's a happy man. Sir, I also think I have no boss, but sometimes I'm tripped up. And, uh, and uh, some people pull my leg and say, listen, you're disobeying me. I told you to do this, you know, et cetera. But I, I aspire to come to a point where I have no bosses. And Sukhanta uh, Sukhaya, we work for our own joy as our own rishis did. And we want to serve society. We have that noble intention and to share whatever we have. That is why we are here. That is what unites us. The pursuit of truth unites and beauty. The pursuit of truth and beauty unites the sciences and the humanities. And with those words, I, I request uh, Professor Sharma uh, to take the program forward. Thank you, sir. Uh, Professor Makran, Makran Paranjabe, uh, you have said it all. Uh, so, so I would be very happy. In fact, you have counted uh, all, all the honors and awards of uh, Professor Vijay Raghavan. So I don't need to read them anymore uh, and a whole lot of other things. Uh, and I just a very quick disclaimer. Uh, the, the blog that you were reading, that was more than six years old. I do have bosses. Uh, so, so that that was back when I was occupying your chair of being a professor, right? Okay, just just that uh, little clarification. Um, and so, indeed, uh, it's very heartening that um, you know this uh, Indian Institute uh, of Advanced Study is taking so much interest uh, in in uh, diverse areas of knowledge. Some of them are called science. Some are called engineering. Some are called transdisciplinary and uh, social sciences and everything else. It doesn't really matter what we call them. 
Uh, and the topic you have today is science, technology, and innovation in India. So there is no better person to talk about it uh, than Professor Vijay Raghavan. Uh, having interacted with him for last six years, a little longer than six years, and having known him before that, uh, we, it so happens that we both graduated from the same lab. Uh, he eight years ahead of me. Uh, but the deep insights uh, and the very broad spectrum of sciences that he knows, uh, I don't think that anybody else in the country. Let me see who all are with us. Okay, so I don't, I need, I don't think I need to change that statement at all. And I'm pretty sure that, you know, the, the very deep perspective, very wide uh, spectrum perspective that he has uh, in science of all kinds, uh, it doesn't really matter what you call it. And more importantly, their integration and their integration with larger concerns of life, of society, uh, and the processes for doing it. Uh, his coordination abilities are out of this world, uh, absolutely. And we have seen that in motion uh, in his tenure as a principal scientific advisor uh, in the last three years. So, um, uh, just to give a little bit of background. Uh, which you did not cover perhaps in as much uh, detail uh, for the benefit of other people who are listening to us. Um, Professor Vijay Raghavan, of course, PSA, a post that was held by Dr. Chidambaram until April 3rd, 2018. So since then, a little bit later, he's, he's been in that uh, chair. Um, and before that, he was Secretary um, Government of India and Department of Biotechnology. Uh, from January 28th, 2013 uh, to February 2nd, 2018. As we know that PSA uh, works with all arms of the government, uh, with all the states and our citizens, national and international agencies. So indeed, uh, it's everything. Uh, so science and technology, often, you know, people have been thinking about it as a vertical. But there, nothing could be farther from the fact so even though we have made a Ministry of Science and Technology, a Department of Science and Technology, really science technology is all pervasive. So it's a horizontal permeating in every ministry, uh, permeating in every sector, permeating in every activity, past or future. Uh, so this coordination role for PSA uh, is, uh, is a most important aspect. And that's something which has in fact not been happening very effectively uh, for a long time. Uh, so, so this is indeed so great that um, uh, that Professor Vijay Raghavan brings with him that insight and energy both uh, at his age, which is very young. I think that this is a fantastic thing to happen. Um, and then, of course, he was before that he was a distinguished. He still is a distinguished professor at National Center of Biological Sciences, which is called NCBS, which is uh, part of uh, TIFR, and he was, of course, the founding director uh, director of NCBS until 2013. As we said, he studied chemical engineering, holds a PhD in molecular biology from the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, was a senior research fellow at Caltech. His research is on nerves and muscles. You see, you, see, you need both. You know, if you want to be PSA, you need muscle and you need nerves. And he's got both of them. So I know where it's coming from now. That is all to do with his research area and how complex behavior emerges during animal development. As was pointed out, Professor Vijay Raghavan, he's a fellow of uh, all the great academies of the world, uh, including all the Indian Science Academies, the Royal Society, uh, foreign associate of U.S. National Academy of Sciences, and he was awarded the Padma Shri by the government of India in 2013. Now, um, so that that really scratches the surface because this is more about the bio data, uh, but the deep thinker and the person that he really is, we really have to work with him to actually understand all those qualities. Um, actually, now I, just, I suddenly remembered. Uh, that uh, Makran said that he he got admitted to Sunny Buffalo but went to Urbana Champagne. With me, it was the other way around. I, I'm not kidding. 
I am really, really not kidding. So we got something in common, but a little bit 180 degree out of phase. Uh, and so I can have a very small world indeed. Now this particular topic that Professor Vijay Raghavan be talking about today uh, is science, technology, innovation in India. It's such a vast, uh, vast subject. Uh, if we were to look at the historical aspects and then also extrapolate to future and look at all the disruptive uh, science and technology, which is happening today uh, at such a great speed, future is coming at us at an unprecedented speed. Uh, so what are those you know, things which are happening? Artificial intelligence, machine learning, the rise of intelligent machines, sustainable development, rise of microbial resistance, what have you, is no longer a problem of science and technology alone. Even if you were to look at climate change, you look at sustainable development, it's not, it is an aspect of science and technology in it, certainly. There are also policies and rules and everything else. But what is most important that this science has to be democratized. Uh, it means that each one of us, in, in a sense, uh, is a participant in that process. It's a shared responsibility to understand some of the science and take it forward in whichever way, as an individual, as an organization, as whoever we are at different levels. So it is so important that we tightly integrate uh, whatever these different compartments of knowledge that we have been calling by different names uh, from psychology to sociology to philosophy to whatever. In fact, it so happens that my first love after high school was philosophy. And I had taken admission in Rajasthan University for that. But my parents and teachers and neighbors, they told me, look, if you do philosophy, you become a professor which is what happened to me. Uh, so unfortunately, you know, life comes full circle, but it's not about me. What I'm trying to say here is that, you see, philosophy plays a huge role in our doing of science, technology, and everything else. But somehow we have dissociated it so greatly uh, with what we call science, and indeed what we call life, because even a general, you know, fellow out there, you tell him, look, philosophy got something to offer to you, and he would just look at it, look at you in a very strange way, because we have totally divorced that, the language, the nomenclature and stuff, you know, is just for our peers. So science technology has to be much wider than that. And Professor Vijay Raghavan is going to tell you about these challenges, about the status of science technology innovation in the country today, and the direction and the path on which we are headed. Uh, in this uh, uh, very, very important activity, uh, which concerns all of us, regardless who we are, it concerns all our future. So it can't simply be lip service. So I'd close by saying uh, that Professor Vijay Raghavan, he was not only, he's a champion of problem solving, or being interdisciplinary, or being multidisciplinary, or being out of disciplinary, transdisciplinary, whatever, but he, he has actually shown that in his life. Uh, so it is not most of us just talk about it and say, hey, you know, it's like saying, hey, it's great to be a soldier, uh, but not my son, my neighbor's son. Uh, but so, so in his case, he has actually translated that uh, much before uh, these terms became very fashionable. Uh, so that gives him a very, um, a, a very different perspective into things that we would be talking about. So let me invite, or Makran could invite, either way, uh, Professor Vijay Raghavan uh, to deliver his lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, uh, sir, you have as much time as you like. We are a few minutes behind schedule, but we won't cut into your time. We are eagerly waiting to hear you. And uh, just on a lighter note, I also was in uh, physics, chemistry, math, and had very reasonably good marks, close to 100%, in fact. But I chose to do English. And then someone told me, you'll go door to door selling detergent. You have a very, you're, you're, you're staring at a very, they told you you'll become a professor, but mere liye to dusra bata diya ke, aapki dasha itni buri hogi, ek samay aega aapko naukri nahi milegi, aur aap detergent, matlab they said you may join Hindustan Unilever or something, and go door to door to sell, uh, Anyhow, uh, 
Uh, of course, the person who told me this said, you have only one more option, which is to do a PhD and reach your level of incompetence as soon as possible. Because for him, doing a PhD was a waste of time. But the only other thing I wanted to say was that every PSA leaves his or her own stamp on the mission. And uh, what we have seen uh, Professor Raghav and Vijay Raghavanji do, he has set up nine missions. So I'll just say one word about them. And these nine missions that he has set up are natural language translation, quantum frontier, artificial intelligence, national biodiversity mission, electric vehicles, bioscience for human life, waste to wealth, deep ocean exploration, and acceleration of the growth of India's innovations, which is, I think, Agni, if I'm not mistaken. And later on, I will request uh, Dr. Akhilesh Guptaji also to say a few words after the talk about some of these initiatives. With these words, sir, over to you. And welcome once again to our distinguished lecture series, sir. Thank you very much, Thank Professor you. Makaran Paranspe, Professor Ashutosh Sharma. Uh, you have actually, you know, not just introduced me, excessively generously, I should say, but also covered many areas which are important. And, uh, you know, if I were wise, which I'm not, I should stop and say any questions. Uh, and, you know, we can carry on. But, you know, I will tread on thin ice by venturing onto topics which are uh, very complex, but nevertheless interesting. And with the community here at the Institute for Advanced Studies, we perhaps can go forward and see what can be done. I'll divide my talk into, uh, I'll be brief, but I'll divide it into three parts. But at the core of the talk is a simple question which we need to address in India. For a complicated set of historical reasons, we have created a society which metaphorically is a mixture of salt and pepper. The pepper are islands of excellence distributed in different themes, different topics, and the salt is the rest of our country. And no matter how much water we pour on this mixture, the pepper does not seem to dissolve and mingle with the salt. The result is we have a France and a Germany on one side, connected with the West in extraordinary ways and disconnected with India. And the assumption is that somehow there is a need for communicating and bringing together the rest of India into a worldview which the pepper holds. But truth will actually be the other way around. Uh, there is historically great rootedness in culture which results in extraordinary science, rootedness of societies, of people. And when that connect is there in a great way, you can have the elite leading philosophical discussions, scientific discussions, and technological development in a manner which is both ecologically and in terms of cultural context, stable and rooted, yet results in development. When you have a situation when that rootedness disappears and you live a life and you study something else to make a living, then as that disconnect amplifies, you have a culture where you're extraordinarily good at serving some other purpose, but you're therefore imitative at the highest level, but you're not able to emulate quality or learn from your surroundings or from elsewhere and be truly valued. Now that is what has come to pass in India, the salt and pepper mix. But this is not a binary that there's just salt and pepper. There are grades of change which are happening. Uh, and also the changing nature of science and technology affords extraordinary possibility for us to renew ourselves in a non-xenophobic, non-jingoistic manner but at the same time, valuing our rootedness, our history, our languages, our culture, in a manner which we lead the world towards a new direction. And the world is in need of a new direction. So what are the three parts which I'll divide my talk? One is how science and technology in the world developed and in India, and the rootedness of innovation in the past. 
and that will be very brief. And similarly, I will go on how accidents of history led to a dramatic change, the development of the colonies, the Industrial Revolution, and how that changed the entire planet, uh, colonization and market economies. And the final part is how we have brought the entire planet through these changes into a state of great peril and what is the route out and where does India play a role. So these are the three components. It's a large canvas, but at the same time, I think we can do justice to it because uh, these are areas which all of us are familiar with in multiple ways and these debates need to amplify. So let's go uh, to the first part, uh, which is, you know, where are we coming from? And really, we are coming from a extraordinary accident which took place about 65 million years ago. 65 million years ago, a meteorite crashed on Earth and caused extraordinary climate change and destroyed the largest animal forms at that time, dinosaurs. And if you go to the Indian Statistical Institute in Kolkata, you will see a skeleton of a huge dinosaur found uh, nearby in India. With the destruction of dinosaurs, we saw the rise of the mammalian radiation and mammals of various kinds started dominating the world. And we understand how all of this came about, how different life forms came about, largely due to the great insight shown by naturalists such as Darwin and Wallace. Naturalists before that had looked at geology, had looked at life around us, and had great insights about how, for example, a small lizard is likely to be related to a big lizard, how humans are likely to be related to other apes, and so on. But Darwin's great insight was a simple one. And he said that all life on Earth has a common origin. And therefore, all the natural beauty, the variations we see, are linked to our past. And this, over time, changes take place and beauteous forms, beautiful forms arise. And these arise by accident, they're selected by the environment and they breed as it were to give more like that. And the other insight which came was from people such as Gregor Mendel, who looked at inheritance within species and pointed out that there is change which takes place within species. Mendel pointed out how peas vary with each other or look like each other. And we know, again, through our civilizations, how people uh, have discussed how people look like their parents or their grandparents or don't look like, and so on and so forth. Uh, so these are interesting, you know, deep observations. And they're there in our cultures about how life forms arose, how they're related to us and how variations come. But the formalization by Darwin and Mendel were critical. But there's another key aspect. Because all life has common origins, all life must have a shared chemistry. And then the next step is the discovery that that shared chemistry comes from the thread of DNA. In other words, DNA has got a structure which allows both permanence as well as mutations which cause change and therefore, and also creates the chemistry of the cell and the organism. And this great insight into nature's engineering came about over decades of research. But this was extraordinary because it was later on allowed, while understanding nature's engineering, for us to also engineer nature. But there was another miracle of evolution which took place, which is completely unforeseen, and we don't know the causes of that. And that was perhaps by our ancestors inventing fire. And there could be other reasons, we don't know yet. But that allowed us to pack protein at high content, high calorific value in a specific meal. Till then, all other apes used to have to eat constantly to keep their body with energy. And that means their brain had a specific proportion with respect to their body size. When we could pack a greater calorific content in every meal, and we don't know whether there are other reasons, 
our brain started growing disproportionate to our body size. And therefore, we became an over-engineered computer. In other words, our circuits were not made, which were made originally for mere survival, for coordination, for ensuring that we see where our enemies are and see where our food is and succeed, suddenly became over-designed with more capabilities. Two other accidents occurred. Evolutionarily, unlike our other cousins, we got the ability to oppose thumb and forefinger. We could catch objects and throw them and make tools. And our voice box and the link to parts of the brain which responded to that allowed us to develop language. So over hundreds of thousands of years, millions of years, we moved from being, you know, on this planet of apes to developing what we have today, the planet of apps. And we do that because we have got a rapid speed of evolution, cultural evolution, in a manner which transcends the speed of biological evolution. So we have become unique beings on this planet in a manner which was absolutely unforeseen. But when biologists study other organisms, they find the vestiges, not the vestiges, I should say, the roots of the diversity of our brain's capabilities in other animals. And we're only now beginning to understand that. So while we have a unique over-designed computer, which when linked to other people who are also computers and to other computers we make, we have extraordinary capabilities, our nerve circuits fundamentally have different components which are similar and their modules, smaller sized, different kinds of function in other animals. Similarly, our chemistry shares a great deal of variation and similarity with plants and bacteria and so on. So there's much to learn about us still by studying the biology of other organisms. But let us move now to what this has meant. This meant our abilities, our change in our brain development resulted in us becoming scientists. Every human became a scientist in a manner different from how animals confronted nature. They confronted nature principally to survive and dealt with it in very complex ways. But we dealt with it in an even more complex way where we could understand that there is a future, remember our past, and deal with our present in a manner which made objects and technologies of value to our future, right? Now, many of these components, different animals do. And, you know, for example, a termite hill has many of these components. Uh, ants domesticate aphids, but humans clearly are different because while all those components have apparently a competence at a social level, there is no comprehension. Humans have developed because of their brain comprehension of what is happening at an individual level and a collective level. And that's where we differ substantially from other social animals, such as termites or ants or, or you know, larger animals and so on. The level of comprehension which an individual has is just transformative. And that transformative competence, uh, comprehension, has gone extracorporeal because of our creating machine. So this is something absolutely incredible. Now, the result of this in today's world I'll come to, but let me now go to the second point of what we've done to the world since we started developing these capabilities of making instruments of change. We started domesticating plants and animals, and one view is that the Anthropocene, the epoch where we are having, as humans, an impact on the Earth, started when we started domesticating plants and animals. So that's one view. Another view is that in 1945, in New Mexico, when we exploded the atomic bomb and left that footprint forever, that was the start of the Anthropocene. A third view is that upon domesticating plants, we realized that we were basically eating up the soil's capability to produce products and therefore needed to, to fertilize the soil. Humans started putting manure and guano back into the soil, but that required a scale of agriculture that, that limited the scale of agriculture, 
which industrializing societies didn't want to be limited. So then they went in the West to nitride mines in China and South America and got nitride from there and started putting them on their fields. And those mines were also completely uh, devastated and used. And then in the early 20th century, the Haber-Bosch process was invented. And that allowed humans to snatch nitrogen from the atmosphere and make ammonia and make fertilizer, and also sadly make chemical weapons and so on and so forth. The Haber-Bosch process transformed agriculture completely. Today, half the nitrogen at least in our bodies comes from the Haber-Bosch process. Earlier it used to come from manure and you know, all the other feeds which we put in the environment. So this is just amazing. This basically broke the limit on growth and said that food is unlimited and therefore growth is unlimited. And combined with the same time when the industrial revolution was taking place in, in Europe, particularly in England, this allowed an extraordinary transformation. Science of the most fundamental science uh, kind was linked to industrial development and that was linked to the development of technology that was linked to colonization and the growth of markets and this exponential growth overthrew what at the foundation was a very different approach to science in places such as India, where there was a you know, conversation with the environment that you saw around you opportunities, but you didn't see those opportunities as unlimited. You didn't see nature as something to be tamed. You saw nature as something to be partnered with and your understanding of the skies, the oceans, the winds were linked to uh, deep philosophical uh, approaches, but also to technological impact in a modest way. There was very little in our culture of opening up the insides, tearing up the insides apart of every component to understand every detail and work in a frenetic manner to use the applications to rule the land, the country, the world. Philosophically, this was a very different approach to science. But the approach which looked at wanting to tame nature and to drive, use the technology which tamed nature to drive the economy was something which took over the world. And this is a pointer. One can get into good and bad and so on. But fundamentally, this is a pointer to the power of the exponential. Things don't necessarily go in a way you would predict if you were in the pre-industrial revolution area, but when things roll in a certain direction, they can exponentially amplify in different ways. So the net result of this is a world today where you have a dominance of certain approaches to science and technology philosophically, and be that as it may. I mean, those differences are you know, value for different cultures to learn from, but the predominant dominance of certain kinds of technologies in a runaway manner has meant enormous disparity. Now, those kinds of disparities have arisen, you know, of two kinds. Historically, till the late or middle uh, 20th century, they were dominantly related to machinery, aspects which you could open up and see. The bulk of the machinery was such that if you open up and if you are reasonably uh, you know, smart, you could figure out what is going on. If your ambassador car broke down somewhere, someone opening it up could spend some time and say, okay, this is what's happening. And this is where it needs cleaning up or fixing. And if a pipe needs to be replaced or a, you know, carburetor needs to be, you know, cleaned up, all of that can be worked out. And then no matter where you go, you have someone who can fix it. Today's car is, uh, you know, you open up the hood, and it's, you know, it's all electronics of various kinds. It's not easy for a breakdown to be attended to by someone who self-learns. You have to have a certified service station. But this has resulted in the dominance of both manufacturing linked to information of a kind which is unprecedented. In other words, the semiconductor revolution resulted in the computer revolution amplifying, even though the fundamentals of computer science lie in mathematics, and statistics deeply rooted in cultures such as India. Many of the aspects of the foundations of computer science come from people who laid the foundations of math mathematics and statistics. And today still, 
even today, if you want to understand artificial intelligence and machine learning, you really need to know statistics uh, and mathematics well, and then go on to the theory of computer science, all of which is eminently learnable on scale, but all of which also has a deep mooring in our cultures. Now, the result of this break from mere manufacturing to manufacturing and knowledge tied to each other, what Ashutosh would call the cyber physical, has resulted in the dominance of what we called uh, artificial intelligence. So now we are in a position where there is what one would call a manthan, a churning of data in a manner where we have to see what comes out, what are the promises and what are the perils. And what's happening is something which is extremely worrisome, yet there's a way out. Now, knowledge right through human history has gone with power. Those who wield knowledge develop technologies and are close to those who have power. And that intertwining of knowledge and power allowed rulers and civilizations to have a structure where there was a class which had this power and others who didn't. There were cultures which had a deep connection with knowledge in multiple ways. But as this kind of growth, which I talked about, started spiraling away, that connection was crushed more and more by the inexorable growth of knowledge and power being linked. So there was a disempowerment of people connected to knowledge. You left your culture and you went to seek knowledge and therefore were proximal to power. Now, with the growth of artificial intelligence, this has happened in an extraordinary way in really, literally in a matter of few years. You have a situation that those who have power to analyze data got from all over the world are increasingly able to tell you what is wise for you to do. And you don't have to have the knowledge or the ability to decide whether you know um, that is done the right way or not. If you want to get your food, you can go to your app and find out you know, where the restaurants are nearby. And depending on what you did, next time you'll be told how to improve upon that. And depending how you rate things, things get better and better and better. And soon, you know, suggestions come to you which are most helpful. This is not just about food. This is about your education. You would be told very clearly that, you know, it's uh, unwise of you to major in English or some other language and you're better off becoming a chartered accountant. And indeed, that might be at a median level for people. And supposing you take the wrong decision, then you'll be told again what to do having taken that decision. And therefore, there's a disempowerment of decision making, which will only amplify. And it's amplifying at an extraordinary scale. It is true that all of this, which we see, is still only artificial narrow intelligence. It is not artificial general intelligence of a kind where you know, people have expressed concern about AI taking over the world and decision making. But theoretically, there is no particular reason why many people argue, some argue otherwise, why you cannot have artificial general intelligence. But fundamentally, again, remember that the foundations of this came in pe from people rooted in a culture of mathematics and statistics and learning. All of what we know today perhaps has got anchors, has got roots in people such as Alan Turing and John von Neumann. Alan Turing did something very extraordinary. Um, he asked, you know, for example, whether in the screen, is there someone who looks like a human? Is that person actually a computer? And that's a Turing test. How would you distinguish a superb computer pretending to be a human from a human itself? And therefore, if some computer passes the Turing test, it would have uh, acquired artificial general intelligence. Turing also uh, you know, defined the Turing computer, uh, and you know, he had very great impact in biology. But the principal point is that the foundations of what we do today have come from people such as him. Now this, I like to end by saying that this now opens up an opportunity, this contrast between the Turing's, the Ramanujan's, you know, our, you know, Kerala School of Mathematics, 
uh, on one side and the huge force of machine learning which we see and we worry about. We say, you know, how is it that we can have a Google in India or not is the kind of debate we have. Can we have an industry here as powerful as that seen in some other country? How can we compete in AI? And this is really the turmoil of the day-to-day -day debate which you have to contend with. And it's a legitimate debate. You know, how do we catch up and or do something novel in nanotechnology or in space or in you know defense research and so on? But at the heart of it is a very simple situation which can and must be remedied. Today, 90% of our research funding goes to places where 10% of our students go i.e. in our central universities and colleges. 90% of our students are from state universities and colleges and there's very little research support. That needs to be dramatically changed. So our research agencies in humanities and science and technology are partnering with each other and with additional resources to create a national research foundation which will inject resources into these sectors. But also, in addition, do something which is that these new injected expanded footprint of science will also take up missions of a kind which are relevant to India. And these, doesn't, these don't have to be only applied or only basic, but they can take on really big challenges which we have not taken on because of this difference between the salt and this pepper. We now have an opportunity to grind the pepper in manner, every manner, so that we do two things. We address problems which are the best problems defined by the best people anywhere in the world at the highest quality. But we also define problems from our environment such that they are the best problems where people anywhere in the world will be excited to address and work. Our entire ecosystem, our entire you know, environment, our extraordinarily diverse and large young demography, if rooted in our land and our culture, which means that everything which we do and what others do must be available to everyone bilingually in their language and in English. This will allow the you know, release of imagination in a manner which has never happened before and breaks this distance of knowledge and power on one side and people on the other. This democratization of science, technology, and innovation and a democratization of opportunity is made feasible strangely by some technologies which today allow power supply to go everywhere very easily, which allow small motors to power, you know, all sorts of objects, which was unthinkable some time back, which allow sustainable growth, but, and also allow linking of people's minds through the internet in fantastic ways. So technology with rootedness today and the fundamentals of technology today, interestingly, are connected with attitudes and rootedness, which we are very comfortable with and familiar with. And therefore, we have the opportunity now to take a, uh, you know, inclusive and imaginative, but also one filled with self-esteem, a direction of our research, where we don't feel that, my God, I have to leave my town or village or my country to learn something which is different and come back and teach them how to be like that, which we aspire to. Now we have a much better jalebi where knowledge flows freely, where technology is applied differentially according to need. And there is a courage and self-esteem that the most complicated uh, of problems will have solutions led by us. Thank you very much. Oh, that was a mesmerizing presentation, sir. I was uh, particularly struck by the culinary metaphor, you know, and uh, to ca carry on with salt and pepper. I think what you're really saying is what we need, need to do is to move from salt and pepper to curry powder, you know, and that will, <laughs> <laughs> because then, or garam masala, because... Uh, Otherwise, salt and pepper are not mixing properly. And, uh, and interestingly, I, I really resonated to what you said about how the pepper sticks out and doesn't dissolve, but the salt 
as the Bible says, is the salt of the earth. So our rootedness, our, uh, uh, you know, deep cultural and our understanding of harmony, you know, between the three worlds, the world that is man-made, human-made, the world of nature in which human beings live, and the so-called other world, you know, the world of the supernatural, the world of wonder and possibilities. I think our ancients understood how to harmonize these worlds, without which uh, human life is itself precarious, as you said. So that was wonderful. And in fact, I was reminded of, a, of an essay that was written by Ainsley Ombre, who really said that science and technology don't mesh in India because they exist in high-walled enclaves, you see, which have no relation to their surrounding world. And my first visit to IIT Kanpur, I was on the selection committee, really illustrated that. You know, like you go far away from Kanpur, maybe you fly into Lucknow, and on the way, you won't believe it, I saw a horse cart, which was so overloaded that the horse had tipped over and was in the air, was suspended in the air. And a few kilometers later, I enter IIT Kanpur. And what was the, uh, you know, connect between these two worlds, you know, a world where you could design a better horse cart where that poor animal wouldn't be strung up like that. And I think I taught at IIT Delhi and there were some experiments in better uh, rickshaws, see, which were very good, I thought. And then even today, I believe in IIT, you can use those rickshaws to travel. But... Uh, I won't take up much time. I want to invite uh, Dr. Akhilesh Gupta to say a few words. He heads the Science Technology Innovation Mission. And uh, I must say, he's a hero. He's a cancer survivor. And we look up to him uh, also uh, because of his own uh, insights and how he has a wonderful spirit, you know, to keep going. I saw this beautiful picture on Daughter's Day you know, of uh, Dr. Gupta and his two daughters, you know, and it was one of the, uh, I think, most extraordinary pictures I saw. Many people were posting pictures with their daughters, but yours was the one that I felt very inspired by, sir. So. so I would like you to say a few words and then we'll throw it open for questions. Please. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Akran. In fact, uh, I too have a little connection with IIT Kanpur. So there is a gang, IIT Kanpur gang that exists in the in Delhi. So, <laughs> so I think uh, I mean this is the right opportune time, and let me take forward the paper and salt story of Professor Vijay. That you know I think this is the right opportune time for India to you know uh, move forward in science and technology and innovation. 7,000 R&D institutions in the country, 1,000 academic institutions, more than 350 autonomous institutions, uh, 3.5 lakh you know, researchers in the country, 1.35 lakh research workers coming up annually from the country. And startup innovation is in uh, the innovation ecosystem is now uh, taking center stage. Uh, and with the leaders like Professor Vijay Raghavan and Professor Ashto Sharma around, I think this is the right opportune time for the country. And so, uh, 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 and there's a interesting, uh, you know, role that they uh, are in fact going to play. And sure. See, uh, Professor Vijay Raghavan has, uh, uh, you know, he has also steered national education policy components and he has led the science and technology innovation policy uh, uh, also. So now this is a unique combination of NEP and STIP. Taking, uh, today was the first meeting of implementation strategy and I was member, uh, a member of that committee. So everybody is now talking that how we create a synergy between STIP and NEP. And I think the role of Professor Vijay Raghavan becomes very important, especially in the context of uh, research and innovation, where the National Research Foundation is going to play a very important role. Uh, I think uh, uh, the uh, PSA office is now, in fact, uh, I don't think it has been 
uh, you know, there is no uh, in the past never been so active uh, than today. And so many missions are there being coordinated by Office of PSA and, uh, and also in the National Research Foundation and and the uh, several other initiatives, PM stick and all the steered by Professor Raghman. I think uh, I would say that uh, the uh, the STI is going to uh, definitely uh, become very important, and I'm sure Professor Raghman, Professor Ashutosh Sharma are going to uh, play a very uh, you know crucial role in taking these messages forward. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, I will uh, now ask people to send their questions to me or, uh, by chat. And uh, while I wait for that, I also was thinking when I was listening to you, uh, Professor Vijay Raghavanji, that, uh, you know, I read, a, uh, I read this morning actually about the Madras hedgehog, you know, and uh, how it hibernates. And I was thinking very much about your, uh, you know, how you said human beings develop brain mass, you know. I think that, uh, and I was linking it up with uh, the question that Sadhguru asked me about, do we understand life? You know, human beings, not just human beings, but I, I mean, human beings do not hibernate normally. But I think now in Shimla, I see that uh, when the weather changes, we sleep less. You know, when it's very cold, we tend to sleep more. As the spring comes, you get up early automatically. So uh, what I'm really, my first question to you is really that, that in nature, you find some animals which hibernate in winters. You find other animals or species which go into a kind of diapause in the heat of summer. If it's so hot, then they adapt to that. What I'm leading up to, and I'll, I'll mention one more thing, and then I'll raise my question. And you know, one of the questions I asked Sadhguru also is about artificial intelligence. And he said, you know, Makrand, memory is not intelligence. And uh, what does artificial intelligence, even the word mean that you have lots of data and you can quickly process things with that data and come up with some responses. But he says, real intelligence is attention and attention has no memory. Now, I'm linking up this question with the earlier question about the Madras hedgehog, an endangered, a tiny endangered creature, about there was an article today in the Hindu, in fact, which is that, uh, you know, did you, do you think, as Darwin said, uh, this is an article, if I'm not mistaken, by Meghna Mojumdar, and she talks about, uh, you know, this naturalist, his name is Mr. Bravin Kumar, you know, he's done a lot of research on Madras hedgehogs and how to, they're endangered. Anyhow, so, you know, the Darwinian approach of natural selection, as well as, of course, uh, uh, you know, uh, the so-called survival of the fittest, which is, I don't think people understand it properly, because it is not the fittest who survive, but those who survive are the fittest, you know, because the dinosaurs were very large and powerful, but you know, they didn't quite survive. And the mammals, as you said, the mammalian radiation. So my real question is this, that, uh, you know, human beings could have, or mammals could have found a way to hibernate, to deal with the smaller food supply. They could have found some other way than to develop a brain that was of excess capacity, as you said. So the real question is that, is there an intelligence? I'm not talking about intelligent design, by the way, not at all. But uh, is, there, is, there a, is, there a, is there an understanding of life, uh, as, as Sadhguru said, which is not entirely mechanistic? That is my question. For example, he said attention. I mean, he said, you yourself do not attend because you're seeing the leaf, the tree, through a name, through a conditioning. Krishnamurti also said that, J. Krishnamurti. He said, you never see because your mind is, you know, so full of conditioning, cluttered that you're not able to pay attention. And uh, in a way, uh, you know, I spent time, you know, when I was in, at university, I had an important uh, person as a neighbor in the, in, in the, who was a postdoctoral fellow. And, uh, you know, he, he worked at Ikrisat. And he said, you know, Makran, my best insights come when I walk to the campus and I just observe. I just look at 
you know, I just look around me. He was a biologist. So anyhow, my question to you is exactly that, that, uh, um, and, uh, uh, you know, we have had a question or two now coming, but first I've asked, I'm asking this question to you. And then I also have a question for Professor Sharma. But so my question is this, that is there a non mechanistic understanding of, uh, consciousness, intelligence, attention, and, and uh, human capacity, evolution, the expansion of the brain, some of which we have seen in our own books, like even in the Yoga Sutras. I'm reading the Yoga Sutras all over again with my wife, Gayatri Ayer, who is a yoga teacher. And the enormous insights of that book, I can't tell you how Patanjali was able to define those states of consciousness, you see. Anyhow, so my question to you, I'll, I'll once again, is there a non-mechanistic, non-deterministic understanding of human consciousness, evolution, attention? So you need to unmute yourself. Sorry, thank you. Uh, this is a very important question, and I'll give you a very brief answer, largely because there are more unknowns than knowns. Now, from a mechanistic level, looking at the, you know, amplification of nerve circuits, both within us as we develop from the embryo uh, later on, and between us and other animals, there is a gradation in what we would call capabilities of various kinds, which are amplified in human. There was an earlier view, and Alfred Russell Wallace had this view, that humans are special and other animals are different. But increasingly it is clear that there are many aspects of our behavior which have the fun foundational fundamentals demonstrated in nerve circuits and other animals. So there is a gradation. But where that has jumped up and distinct from our biology is because of a consequence of a cultural evolution, sociology and other aspects have amplified that beyond measure. Now there's another biological component which we haven't explored sufficiently in what is mainstream science. As I said, one way to look at our brain is to say it's over-designed. But that over design allows us to create experiences, quote unquote experiences, or feelings, or you know, various kinds of uh, situations purely by driving the function of components of our brain in the context of what we have learned. So it's not just a physical aspect in that, it's just our brain, if it were in a chemical vat, it would behave the same way but it's a brain with our experiences and our body and so on, can drive things to, uh, for example, experiences which come from meditation, from yoga, <clears throat> from induced or uninduced, chemically induced or other hallucinations. These are areas which we understand very, very little about how uh, the brain works. So that's the important point. You know, there are many things which are clearly, you know, outside the realm of, biology alone, but include biology and other kinds of aspects. Biology is, of course, the key. You know, you can't have these in the absence, at least as far as we know, of the biological vehicle. So that's one aspect. Now, in terms of consciousness, there are two broad schools of thought. One is a school espoused by people such as a philosopher called Dan Dennett, who is a philosopher who also looks at neurobiology. And his point is that whether, and he has got a wonderful book called Bacteria to Bark and Back. He says the complexities of a bacterial cell, which is senses and then responds, are enormous and we know very little about that. Just as we know rather little about how, you know, Western musicians or those who appreciate Western music understand and appreciate Bach, right? How does this happen? How does this, you know, brain deal with uh, our ability to understand or not the bacteria or music. His view is that much of what we call consciousness and so on is a non-problem 
It is something which is a creation of our interactions. And we just, our brain functions by making quick and approximate decisions, which it refines from experience. And there is no deep, you know, learning to be made about consciousness. So that's the Dan Dennett school. The other school is that consciousness, so in his view, Dan Dennett's view, consciousness is not a hard problem. It's a problem which is difficult in terms of scale and so on and so forth, but it's not an intrinsically hard problem which requires new approaches to look at. Whereas there are people, you know, there are many others, Christoph Koch, Sam Harris, and others, who claim that consciousness is a hard problem. And therefore, it's not that you require non-material inputs, perhaps you do, perhaps you don't, but you really require to approach it in a different way. It is not solvable by this method. So these are the main contentions in the West. Now, both these groups, they interact closely with Eastern philosophy, with you know, uh, yogis, with you know, Buddhists, Zen uh, philosophers and so on, and both interpret you know, what is happening in their own way. But this is a very, very important and interesting area. These are the kinds of things which, you know, when we expand our research footprint, the link between these kinds of questions and Indian knowledge systems and current neuroscience is a very, very important and exciting area. Sorry, I took too long for a short answer. No, that's that's brilliant. Actually, we've had a series of fellowships in this area of consciousness, and we just had a philosopher, Professor Ramesh Chandra Pradhan, who uh, just wrote a book with Springer published on this problem. And he makes the he contends that the Indian approach is very different from the West because it sees consciousness as antecedent. It, it sees it as prior to uh, to neurobiology. And you know, it's very hard to prove it either which way. But speaking about the Yoga Sutras, there's a sutra very, I mean, third or fourth, which says, Tada Drashtu Swarupe Avasthanam. So they first say yoga. Chitta Shuddhi Nirodha, Chitta Vritti Nirodha. And then he says, Tada Drashtu Swarupe Avasthanam. So basically what they're saying is even if you, Chitta Vritti, the, the, the functioning of the brain, whatever, the waves, the thoughts, even if you reduce it to a minimum, consciousness doesn't disappear. And now we've seen through the Institute and Dalai Lama and other people that the brain waves can be reduced to quite a low level, but you can be fully conscious as opposed to being in deep sleep where uh, you may not remember anything. So Subhash Kak, our friend who's also on your panel, does work on this area of consciousness. Uh, I, I don't know how much time we have, but we've got a question now for uh, uh, Professor Sharma. Uh, and the question, I mean, it has to do with uh, the numerous fellowships announced on the DST uh, website, and they are really extraordinary. There are fellowships for people coming back from India uh, coming back to India, whether they're abroad, if they want to come back and work. There are fellowships for Indians who want to work abroad for some time. There are fellowships for women. There are fellowships from disadvantaged areas who, who want to work on science. There are fellowships for people who have unique science problems, which, which need support, etc. So the question is, is it possible also to uh, start up a line of uh, these interdisciplinary areas where people in the humanities would like to Indian knowledge system or even science, uh, sorry, history of science, you know, philosophy of science, which should be hosted at the DST and not at the, you know, uh, and where, you know, there are people doing, uh, uh, you know, humanities and social studies in IITs or in philosophy departments, because I think there'll be a different kind of expectation and rigor when it's hosted at the science end. So should there be a line opened up for this? And then language studies, because language and cognition are deeply linked. So this was a question that came up. Uh, sir, would you like to answer this or should we uh, take some more questions? Professor Sharma? Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. no. Let's first answer this and then take more questions. Uh, th this, uh, this question is very simple answer. Yes, uh, we should do it. Uh, it can be done. Uh, I, have, I have no doubt about the importance of this approach. Now, of course, uh, positioning them in DST or elsewhere, that's something that one has to, uh, you know, think about as to where they would be, uh, you know, most fruitful experience for them, uh, experience of growth. Sometimes I joke, huh? this is strictly a joke, that there are two scientists in DST. Both of them are with you. 
Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, there are more. Uh, uh, the point is that um, you know, an academic pursuit has to grow in an academic space. Uh, DST and all of these being ministries, they are mostly dealing with files. Um, and I think, but anyway, that's not the point. The point basically is, do we have uh, postdocs and stuff in interdisciplinary studies? Of course, it happens a lot in different sciences, engineering and so on, but can it be truly interdisciplinary in terms of bringing in uh, the societal component and other social sciences and humanities or by whatever name call him. Uh, so certainly it's doable. And I'm sure even NRF uh, will make uh, a push uh, in that direction. I would rather have fielded your earlier question. Please, <laughs> please, please go ahead. Some other day. I, I just, I, no, just say very quickly. There is something you said about whether consciousness is deterministic. There is a misunderstanding of determinism in science. So uh, on a very simple level, actually nothing is deterministic, uh, you know, even in material realm. So from quantum to classical three body problem, nothing is deterministic in the sense that people think about deterministic in terms of predicting future with arbitrary accuracy for all times. Okay, so that is fundamentally a flawed view of science. So, I, you know, this itself would take many hours uh, to explain that. But the whole point is that we don't really teach that uh, to our students. Uh, e even the view of people who are scientists who have done it for 50 years, they don't necessarily understand this point. And so, therefore, the view is, well, is it mechanistic? It depends on what you mean by mechanistic. The second aspect, look, a whole lot of these are very good questions, but we shouldn't be looking for answers here in any case. So uh, it's a seed. The second aspect, which I quickly say, um, is that you see consciousness, our link to consciousness and the world is through perception. The perception itself is not understood. So what is the fundamental nature of perception the scientific view of perception uh, probes one aspect of it, which is, which is basically mechanistic, which says, look, how do I convert one set of symbols into another? So a photon hits, it creates an uh, electric impulse. Then it may set up chain reaction in terms of chemical reactions. Chemical reactions may again uh, you know, convert into photons or anything else is basically saying is exactly the problem that you have in which a string of zeros and ones map onto a picture, for example. Now the information contained in zeros and ones is the same as that contained in the picture. I say mathematical transformation. So the scientific research into perception basically addresses that limited question. It does not it cannot, by its very nature, it cannot probe the subjective nature of perception. And it's the same issue which is also related to um, Neumann's machine, for example, or the test of intelligence in a black box. Uh, all of that is mechanistic, totally. And, and it is possible to address and answer that, uh, but not the question that you ask, which is of a very different nature. Okay, well, so that's it. Yeah, thank you. Well, absolutely. In fact, uh, these questions hinge on uh, notions of human exceptionalism. I mean, is are human beings uh, somehow endowed with something which is different from other species? Or is it a, a kind of, uh, you know, cline? Is it a kind of incline in which uh, we are just a little more enhanced than other other animals, you know? Uh, and, uh, you know, again, some people will say that human exceptionalism is a myth, is an illusion and not scientifically supported. And other people will say no, because, as you said, subjectivity and consciousness are uh, somehow, 
you know, not binary, not zero one zero one, but something else. And the claims of our mystics, samadhi. I was coming to that in yoga sutras. We are not able to define scientifically where uh, the state of samadhi. Uh, you know what happens in that state is not. You know what kind of perception occurs, what kind of brain functioning occurs, uh, etc. So uh, I mean, again, this is a very interesting debate, but. You know, uh, just to do a little business, I think we would be very happy to host a couple of fellows if you are willing to, uh, you know, award them for two years. We can host them or we can come up with some collaboration on topics of mutual interest. We have the infrastructure to host people and I suppose you have the resources to fund them. And, uh, you know, together we can uh, work on certain areas together uh, in the broader picture that our uh, PSA can provide us in terms of the mission that we are all working towards in India. And now a question has come, uh, which is asked so very often, and it has to do with, you know, there was a survey in, uh, I guess, one of the newspapers where they said, everybody's going abroad. All our toppers are abroad. They're already there or they're on their way. And the question is, most of our top students and scholars leave India post-school education they do very well in science abroad. In India, they're not able to do that well. What are the steps we are taking to make India attractive uh, for these people in science and research? Is that to uh, me, Makara? Yeah, well, they ju it just came to me. Whoever yes. can answer. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, no, very broadly, the challenge is a simple one. We raise this question because both those who leave and where they come back, if they do, are in a very small fraction of our very large population. So it looks like everyone is going. Sure, many, many people in this small elite population are going, but not everyone else. That's neglected. And secondly, when people come back, they are happy or unhappy, depending on where they come back again to this elite context. So two simultaneous changes are needed, and I think both are happening. It's not that they're not. One is that the quality of our institutional structures, which are already there, need to be strengthened so that obvious opportunities to stay on in research-driven modes are more available uh, over here. And that has happened substantially. If you look at the fraction of people, for example, from our top engineering institutions going abroad, um, that has decreased over time. But at the same time, the questioner is perfectly right. India's education export bill is somewhat similar to our petroleum import bill. So it is not a small volume we're sending out for undergraduate education, even of a relatively ordinary kind, let alone the elite kind. So this points to a deeper failure to those who can afford it, and an even deeper failure to those who cannot afford for not ensuring availability of quality education on scale. Now, the new education policy actually substantially addresses this. And the ways of implementing that are in full motion. The Higher Educational uh, you know, uh, Institute change, uh, Act, which are changing, making it flexible for students to take on multiple kinds of courses in locations elsewhere from where they're admitted. So these are sea changes which have actually been proposed. So I think you'll start seeing impact very soon uh, in both two different contexts which we need to address. Exactly. I think that it will take a few years, but transfer of credits and uh, a kind of smorgasbord approach. You can take courses in music and art, even if you're yes. working for a degree in science. But uh, here's another question somebody has sent me in the chat mode. They're saying that, uh, is this a pipe dream? because science education is going down the tube. Uh, somebody who's got a BSc from Bhagalpur doesn't know the basic, uh, uh, he said, science, math, kuch nahi aata, aise bija hai. So, and these are the bulk, these are the bulk of our BSCs who don't even know uh, the, the ABC, so to speak, of, of the sciences. You know, this... That science education yeah, is going yeah. down, that's it. This is a valid concern. If you look, and the solutions are difficult, if you look at it from, you know, the requirement 
that you have to improve every school and college the way it is alone, and that is your direction. And that is not just a pipe dream. To do that top down will just not work out. Uh, it's it's just impossible. What is needed is something which is much more complex, but perhaps actually doable. And that harks back to a situation where learning and scholarship was something done at a level where the units of interaction were small in number. And therefore, our focus should be not on getting this kid from Bhagalpur into a college, training that person in a job which will require the person to go to Delhi or Mumbai and having a complete disconnect. I think the opportunity to go to Delhi or Mumbai or to Oxford should be there. But at the same time, a cultural change in how one deals with and creates employment in local situations has inquiry in local context need to be done. Now, this seems like too far along the road to invest in. But unless we invest in this combination of both skilling and employment generation, but at the same time, a rootedness in your local problems and their solution, we are going to end up in a situation where someone from Bhagalpur will become a top IT engineer in Bangalore, but will not have the heart and soul and mindset to address problems in Bhagalpur, nor will others have the uh, you know, mindset to address. So we must bridge both these gaps. They're very tough uh, challenges. They're non-trivial, but they're doable. Uh, we have to set, see, the point is very simple. At independence or at other times, we had a shared sense of purpose. Once you have that shared sense of purpose, these complexities are solvable. Otherwise, we will go to a situation where we state the problem and say it is someone else's problem to solve it. Uh, we also need to, that luxury is substantially that of the journalist, which is a legitimate luxury of the journalist to state the problem and say, aap kuch kar rahe and so on. So the rest of us must combine that luxury with rolling up our sleeves and trying to do something. And that's not easy. It's easy to say that, but it, it's, it's something which we should try and do. Absolutely. I think owning up, uh, you know, to these responsibilities is a big challenge, but, you know, on the ground, things can be disheartening. Here's a question about uh, Srinivas Vembu, the founder of Zoho. Can this be replicated or is, is it a one-off wonder? See, what Vembu has done is something actually amazing. He is a billionaire who made his billion uh, establishing Zoho. He has moved to a you know, rural area in Tamil Nadu and he set up his company headquarters based over there. And he's training local people. He's involved in changing the school and other aspects. Now, that is... You know, I think this is a fantastic example. And today's technology allows you, I mean, 20 years back, I would have said, okay, so here's one guy who's done something in a rural area. How is that going to affect Bagal? Right? Uh, how is it going to affect 10 other areas? But the point is, learning about Vembu and publicizing that allows 100 other Vembus to come. And therefore, two things are needed. One, a Vembu as an exemplary, and the other is great detailing of every experience that he and his team are undergoing. And that should be up so that now that is a learning experience for the next one to go to the next level in a different context. So absolutely, that's fantastic. One other point he makes, which is important. He's got a software company anchored there. He's training people locally. They get into the company, they're doing well. He then points out, he doesn't stop there. He goes to the next stage. He points out, look, we have a problem on our hands. Here are people earning money but they have nothing to buy locally. They, with that money they get, they have to still buy an iPhone. They can't buy, you know, they still have to buy a scooter made in somewhere else. There's no local manufacturing which is growing. So you can't have an entire community based on its wealth coming from a fraction of its people running an IT company. Today's technology allows you to run a remote IT company from anywhere, but there also has to be local manufacturing. But today's technology also allows you to have manufacturing of a certain kind locally, and that's what he's now additionally trying to do. So his key point is that manufacturing must also be local, not just employment generation. Yeah, I think that's a wonderful story, as you said. You've, uh, uh, I mean, you've pointed out how important it is to highlight it with the detailing 
so that others can also take that leap of faith. You know, I also read about Sonam Wangchuk making solar tents for our uh, soldiers out in Ladakh. Uh, so that uh, otherwise they were burning fossil and it was very unhealthy. There was carbon monoxide. So, I mean, these are the stories that get highlighted. There's a problem of scale and so forth. But uh, I think that uh, on that note, on that, uh, I think on that very optimistic note, I thank you all for joining in today. And uh, so if you can send us the script, then we usually publish uh, some of this material. Uh, uh, you know, uh, what we do is uh, sometimes it's a one-off thing in a booklet form or we can, we do a series. We are now just doing our, our Radha Krishnan Memorial Lectures as a series. So a distinguished lecture series, you, you know, we, we would be very happy to publish a volume which would have this lecture. And uh, I hope that uh, we can continue this conversation. And uh, uh, Professor Sharma, Dr. Gupta, please don't be entirely surprised if you're next up in this series a couple of months down the road, okay? So uh, we will discuss with you possible topics to take this conversation forward and uh, play our own small role in science, technology, and innovation in India. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you all. Bye -bye. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Great pleasure. Thank you. Thank I would you. not be surprised at all, but you may be surprised with my response. <laughs> I just hope, I hope you say yes. There is no other response which will be acceptable. Please say yeah, yes. Yeah, but keep it a surprise. Yeah, <laughs> see you. See you. Bye-bye. In fact, in fact, in fact the, the wonderful surprise would be if you come to Shimla, then we'll... I want, to come, to I want to come to Shimla. Let's do that. Wonderful. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, if I'm you. coming to Delhi next, I'll try to see, see at least Please. one of you three depending on who has a few minutes for me. Thank you no, so no, much. We'll, thank, we'll you. Be done. thank you. Thank you. Namaskar. Thank you. Thank you.